Good evening, church family. It is great to be here and uh, so great to see everyone out. So very thankful for the presence of all of those who are able to be out on this Wednesday night as we open up God's Word and study together and appreciate those at home who are viewing. Appreciate you and what you mean to us. We are going to pick up our study in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, here in just a, a few moments, but I'd like to begin with a a word of prayer, and uh, I'm going to ask Brother Jesse if he would to come and lead us in that prayer, and then we will go ahead and get started. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for this day that you've blessed us with, for the, for the beauty of nature and the sunshine and the pretty days that we get to enjoy. Father, they show us your, your power and your glory. And Father, we pray that as we enter into this Bible study that we will that we will see your glory through your word. Help us to, to take your word and and enter it into our minds and study on it and and change ourselves through it. Father, we pray for everyone that's not able to be here tonight, whether by sickness or other problems or ailments, we, we pray that you'll be with them and strengthen them so they can be back with us. And help us, Father, to always be encouraging and loving and kind and, and to share your gospel and be a shining light for you wherever we go. Please be with David as he teaches this lesson today. Give him the, the ability to, to remember his studies and to present it to us so that we can we can be better Christians. We ask this prayer in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Appreciate that prayer so, so very much from Brother Jesse. <clears throat> I want you to try your very best if you can take your mind away from 2021 and go back to the time wherein John is writing to the church, these seven churches of Asia here that we are reading about in the book of Revelation. And I want you to imagine what they were feeling, what they were experiencing after they had read chapter 13. That a ruler that was already ruling them was going to get worse. That there would be those who would arise in power who would not only persecute them, but put many of them to death all because of their faith in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of the world. Not only that, but there would be a false prophet or a series of religious teachers who would rise forth and they would have an image that would be constructed of the first beast that we read about in Revelation chapter 13. And they would try to trick and deceive the people into worshiping that image. And they made things very difficult for them if they did not worship that image. If you were in those shoes, if you felt what they felt, what kind of a message would you need? You would need a message of victory, wouldn't you? And that's exactly what you see at the beginning of Revelation chapter 14. You see a message of victory. The text opens up with the Lamb, and we understand that the Lamb is none other than Jesus Christ. And the Lamb is pictured or portrayed as standing, and the word standing there bears the idea of victory. The Lamb is standing victorious, and He is standing victoriously, if you remember, on Mount Zion. And do not forget the significance, the importance of Mount Zion. Understand these people to whom this letter was written, and recognize to them what Zion stood for. We made mention of three things. Number one, it stood for salvation. Number two, it stood for strength. And number three, it stood for security. And these people, these saints, these 144,000 that we have been talking about, these represented all of those who were faithful to God. They stood there with the Lamb meant that they stood in strength and they stood in power and they stood in victory with not just any name, but they stood with the Father's name. And that name of the Father represented the fact that they belonged to the Father. They refused to bear the name of that image. They refused to be receiving that mark, that the image that the false prophets wanted them to bear. They bore the name of the Father, which meant that they were in the possession of the Father. And being in the possession of the Father, they had the power of the Father. They had the peace of the Father. And they had the presence of the Father in their lives. Now, if I had lived back then, 
I would be feeling pretty good, wouldn't you? And not only that, they are there singing the new song. And it's a song of victory, no doubt. I don't know what that song is going to be like. But I look forward to the day when I sing it with the rest of the saints, don't you? Oh man, I look forward to that day. And these saints had that hope. And you and I today, regardless of what happens in this world, we have that very same hope. That is the message that John wants these people to have. It's a message of hope. It's a message of victory. Now, after the new song, what we uh, did not have the opportunity to talk about is we were talking about the Lamb and the 144,000. What we want to do, or what John does, is in verses 4 and 5, he identifies who the 100 and 44,000 are. Now, we have already identified them, if you remember back in chapter 7. And in chapter 7, we saw that it was those who were sealed. What kind of seal did they have? They had the seal of God upon them. They had the recognition that they were the children of God. Now, what seal is it upon us as God's people? Do we have that God identifies us as His children? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the seal that is upon you and me. And when God looks, just like under the Old Testament times, when He came through in the plague of the death of the firstborn, what was He looking for? He was looking for the blood. And as God looks upon us today, He is looking for the blood. And when you and I are baptized into Jesus Christ, we come in contact with that blood. And as we walk in the light as He is in the light, that blood continues to cleanse our lives and to mark us as His children. The sealed, those who have been uh, come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, they are the individuals who are the 144,000. But what John does in verses 4 and 5 is he gives us further explanation as to who these individuals are. And we want to take the time to identify them. Note, if you will, beginning in verse 4, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, remember, if you will, that what he is saying in the context of the Scriptures, he is saying number one identifying mark is that they are male virgins. Because look at what it says. These are the ones who were not defiled with women. And then it turns right around and says that they are virgins. Now, if we take this literal, then immediately there will be no women, no females among the number of the 144,000. And that is just not a proper conclusion. Not only that, but if we take this passage literal, then every man who is not a virgin cannot be a part of that 144,000. And so you see the extremity of trying to make a literal application here. This is symbolic. And so therefore, what does it represent symbolically speaking? Okay, let's begin, first of all, with the word women. Okay? And I want you to go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 17. Let's just go over a couple of chapters. The chapter 17, and I want you to begin reading with me in verse 1 as John is writing here. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of, now look at what it says, the great harlot who sits on many waters. So what is John doing? He is about to tell, or uh, he is about to speak of the harlot who is sitting upon the many waters. Now, if you drop down to verse 5, this harlot is identified as Babylon the Great. Now, is that literal Babylon or is it representing something? It's representing something. Stay within the context because this entire context is about the great harlot who sits on many waters. She's identified as Babylon the Great there in verse 5. And if you drop right down to verse 15, look at what the Bible says. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits, that goes right back to verse 1, here's who they are. They are the peoples, the multitudes, the nations, and the tongues 
So the waters represented what? It represented all of mankind in that particular era of time. And the waters, or if you will note once again, you've got the harlot. Now, we're still trying to identify who this harlot is. If you'll drop down to verse 18, you'll see her again. And the woman, that's the woman, that's the harlot, that's Babylon the great. And the woman who you saw is that great city. That goes back to verse 5. Now watch this. Which reigns over the kings of the earth. Question. Historically speaking, who was that at this time? You know what's so interesting about it? There is a great debate about the book of Revelation on the date. Some will date this book around A.D. 70. Others are going to date it around early 90s. Regardless of where you date it, who was reigning at that time? It was Rome. So tell me who the woman, the harlot, or Babylon the Great is being referenced to here in this book. It has to be referring to Rome. Now, with that thought in mind, I want you to go back to our text. When we look at the word women here in verse 4, I want to submit unto you that it's talking about Rome. Now, let's back up to the word defiled. Look at that word defiled. What does it mean? The word defiled literally means to pollute or to stain. In the New Testament, when you see this word, it's often referring to those who pollute or those who stain themselves sexually speaking whether it be fornication or which is a sexual relationship outside of marriage or whether it be adultery you're unfaithful to your spouse okay now with that thought in mind i want you to keep in mind also that under the old testament i want us to think, take our minds back to the old testament under old testament times idolatry was identified as spiritual adultery. How do we know that? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. You get to Jeremiah chapter 3, and there in verse 8, I want you to note what the Scripture says. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery. Now there, uh, Jeremiah says that Israel had committed what? Adultery. Physical or was it spiritual? Let's read on and the text will tell us. I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery. How? Do you see it? With stones and trees. Tell me what they're doing. They are bowing down before an image. That is idolatry. And under the eyes of God or in the eyes of God, idolatry is recognized as spiritual adultery before God. Now, with that thought in mind, I want you to go to 1 John chapter 5 in verse 21. Go to the book of 1 John chapter 5, and I want you to look at verse 21 with me. In 1 John 5, uh, 5 my tongue on that. In 1 John 5 in verse 21, look at what John says. Little children, keep yourselves from what? From idols. Question, why is John warning them, encouraging them to keep themselves from idols? Brothers and sisters in Christ, if the worship of idols under the Old Testament was spiritual adultery, please tell me what it is under New Testament times. Please tell me what it is under the times now, the Christian age wherein we are living. It is still recognized as spiritual adultery idolatry whether it be in the old testament or in the new testament today is always identified as spiritual adultery why is that because the bible teaches us as members of the church that you and i we are married to christ we are how do we know that go to romans chapter 7 in verse 4 go to the book of romans chapter 7 and i want you to look at verse 4 
Romans 7 and verse 4. Paul writes, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you, and he's writing to the church, keep that in mind, that you should be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear forth fruit to God. Now Paul tells these brethren, the church at Rome, that they are married to him who is raised from the dead. Who was that? That's Jesus Christ. So who is Paul saying that they were married to? He was saying you are married to Christ. And just like you and I today, we are married to Christ. And there was an expectation of them being married to Christ. Likewise, there is an expectation of us being married to Christ. Likewise, there was an expectation of the church in Revelation that was married to Christ. What is that expectation? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and look at verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I want you to look at verse 2 there. All right? 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. What is Paul saying to the church at Corinth here? That as being married to Christ, being betrothed to Christ, you must be a chaste virgin. Not chaste, C-H-A-S-E-D, someone running after you, but chaste, meaning that you are proper, that you are righteous, that you are living a life of complete and utter purity. So look at what our what their responsibility as the church was to remain pure and in a spiritual sense remain a chaste virgin to Christ. What is that talking about? That's simply talking about remaining pure. How is it that we can become unpure? Idolatry. Anything that we would label as an idol or we can recognize or identify as an idol in this life, if we give allegiance to it, then we lose our spiritual virginity. And that's not going to be great in the eyes of God. In fact, go to James chapter 4 and verse 4. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 4. What does James say here? Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship of the world is in enmity with God? Now James calls them adulterers and adulteresses. You tell me why. He's accusing them of idolatry. Here's the idolatry. They had become friends with the world. What was first and foremost in their life? The world. Right? That's why John says don't love the world. Why? Because when we have a greater love for the world than we do for God, what does it become in our lives? It becomes adultery. Spiritual adultery. Same identical Bible writer who would warn, keep yourselves from idolatry. We have to keep ourselves from it. Now, with those thoughts in mind, let's go back to the text and look at what John says. These are the ones who were not defiled with women. What is John talking about? What is it that they, those false teachers, wanted them to do in chapter 13? They wanted them to bow down to that image. Did they do that? No. They remained pure to God. Some of them did not. Many of the people of the world did not. How do we know that? Go over to chapter 18. Go over to chapter 18. And keep in mind, we're still talking about Rome and we're still talking about this idea of being a chaste virgin. But look at uh, Revelation chapter 18 and, and look at verse 2 so we'll know that we're talking about Rome or Babylon. And he cried mildly with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Right? There's Babylon. And what is Babylon? In the book of Revelation, Babylon is identified as none other than Rome. Drop down to verse 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. What was the problem with these people? 
they did not remain chaste virgins, but rather they committed spiritual fornication and adultery. John is saying that the 144,000 are those who are remaining pure to Christ. Number two, look at what he says. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Who are the 144,000? Number one, they are those who have remained pure to Christ. Number two, they are the ones who follow Him. And look at the emphasis, wherever He goes, regardless. These are individuals who are going to allow nothing to keep them from following God. Reminds me of the book of John chapter 10 and verse 27 where Jesus would say, My sheep hear my voice. And they do what? Oh, they follow me. It's interesting that when you think about the word following or the phrase following Jesus, that that's talking about discipleship. And so the idea here is that these people, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They remain disciples. Number one, they remain chaste. They remain pure to Christ. They remain the disciples of Christ. They keep on following Him wherever He goes. Look at number three. <clears throat> These were the redeemed from among me. Now brothers and sisters in Christ, if there was no other term in the text than this one right here to identify who, keep in mind in the context He's still talking about who the 144,000 are, right? These are the ones. These are the 144,000, okay? That's who he's talking about. And he identifies them as the redeemed. The question, what does the word redeemed mean? The word redeemed literally means to, uh, it literally is identified as the purchase of a slave with a view to freedom. That's the literal definition. To buy back. To purchase. Now, when you think about the redeemed, who is it who is our redeemer? Who redeems us? Well, it's Jesus Christ. Go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Go to Galatians 3 and look at verse 13. Galatians 3, 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. But look at what the text opens up and says. What has Christ done for us? He's redeemed us. Who is Paul talking to here? He's talking to the Christians there in the church at Galatia. And what are you and I? We are Christians. And if Paul told these people that they were redeemed by Christ, when you think about the people that John is writing to, who redeemed them? Jesus Christ. Who is it that redeems you and me? It's Jesus Christ, right? How is it that we are redeemed? Look at what Peter would say in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And what Peter said, beginning in verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed, there's our word, redeemed, with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by the tradition of your fathers, but with, here's what we were redeemed with, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. Not only do you have the identification of the lamb right there in that verse, but it also tells us the price that it took to redeem us. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. Now who is it who has the blood of Jesus Christ in their life? It's those who have been baptized into Christ. It's those who have come in contact with Christ. It's individuals who are identified as Christians. They are saints. They are the redeemed. And those who are redeemed are part of this number of the 144,000. It doesn't stop there. Look at the next part. These are the first fruits into the Lamb. Being the first fruits into the Lamb. Now, the first fruits to God. What in the world is that talking about? Go with me, if you will, to the book of Exodus chapter 23. Go to Exodus chapter 23. We're thinking about the idea of first fruits. In Exodus chapter 23. I 
I want you to look at verse 19 with me. Exodus 23, 19. The first fruit, the first of the first fruits of your land, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's head. What were the first fruits of the land? What do you think that was? That was the very best, right? I mean, you, you know what it's like when you plant a garden. And I love green beans. And, and you know, when you, when you plant green beans, you know, you can pick them and, and they're going to be good. And then if, if you'll wait, sometimes there'll be another harvest. But I have learned that that second harvest is not quite as good, not, not quite as plentiful as the first one. But it's that very first harvest. And the idea was that the first fruits represented the very best of the best. That's what you give to God. Now you take that idea back to Revelation chapter 14, the first fruits of God. Who are the first fruits to God? It's the people they were writing to. John was writing to. As I have the blessed privilege to stand here this evening. Who are the first fruits of God? It's my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's those who are faithful to the Lord. There's no one particular Christian who is a first fruit, but all of those who are faithful to the Lord. You know what we are? We are the first fruits to God. And that's the way these people are identified, the 144,000. And then finally, verse 5, And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault, before the throne of God. The word deceit in their mouth was no deceit. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 9. You think about Jesus. One of the things that Isaiah said about him that, that uh, there was in his mouth was no guile. Um, and likewise, when you think about Peter, Peter would rehearse that very same idea in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 21 and 22. There, you know, there was no guile in his mouth. But I want you to note the next thing that it says, that they are without fault. Likewise, when you think about the phrase without fault, fault that, that, that applies to Jesus. He was an individual who was identified in his life as an individual who had no fault. They could not find it. And do you understand that the word blameless here today it applies to the church. Oh, it does. Go with me, if you will, to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. And I want you to look at what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to note verse 27. Keep in mind that he's talking about the church and he says that he might present her to himself a glorious church. That's what the church is not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without what? Without blemish. When you think about those who are without fault, who is identified in Ephesians chapter 5, it's the church. And because of the blood of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, you and I are without blemish not because you and I are so good but because God is so good remember we are justified you know what the word justified means remember this imprint it in your mind don't forget it just as if I'd never sinned and that was the way that these brothers and sisters in Christ are being presented. So who were the 144,000? They were individuals who remained pure to Christ. They were individuals who were disciples of Christ. They were the redeemed. They were the first fruits to God. And they were without blemish. Now, let me ask you a question. Who are of the 144,000 today? Are we individuals who we are striving to remain pure to Christ? Are we? Are we individuals who we are striving to be disciples of Jesus? We follow Him wherever He leads. Are we individuals that we are redeemed? You better be. You want to be on the Lord's side. You've got to be redeemed. You've got to have the blood of Christ in your life. 
Are we individuals that are the first fruits to God? Are we individuals who are members of the church who are without blemish? And don't miss the last phrase. Don't miss it. Where are they? Before what? Before the throne. Do we not have the hope that someday we too will be before the throne? Now let me ask you a question. Go back to that era of time. Would that message have encouraged you? Oh, folks. It, you can almost see the smiles beginning to appear upon the faces of these Christians in this era of time. And likewise, is that a message that should bring a smile to our face? I believe it should. We stand with the Lamb. We stand on Mount Zion. We do. We have salvation. We have strength. We have security. We bear the Father's name. We belong to Him. We are of His possession. You know, you think about the book of Revelation. Oh, let's don't study it. It's too hard to understand. Who in the world would not want the message that we have just read in verses 1 through 5? I want that message. And I need that message. And you need that message. Regardless of what era of time we may find ourselves living in. Okay. So, Note, if you will, beginning in verse 6 and going through verse 13, you have the message of the three angels. All right? You've got three different angels and they are going to present three different messages. Let's begin with the first, me with the first angel and look at the message that he presents beginning in verse 6. And note what, what John says. Then I saw, remember that phrase, then I saw, how did he begin the chapter? Then I look. In other words, he's, he's trying to get the attention of the people. This is what I saw. This is what I want you to see. Again, you see it. Then I saw John see something that's important. He wants the attention of the people. Likewise, he wants our attention. This is something we need to take heed and take note of. Then I saw another angel. And look at what he's doing. He's flying in the midst of the heavens. Well, that's familiar, isn't it? You remember back in chapter 8 and verse 13, you've got the eagle and he's flying in the midst of the heaven. What do you think that represents? You think of high noon. What does that represent? When it's high noon, that's when the sun is in the highest part of the sky, just, just right over the top of us where every, it can be seen everywhere. And the idea is that what you are about to see is something that's going to be known and recognized and seen everywhere. And so you've got this angel. He's flying in the midst of the heaven. And whoa, watch this. He's got the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. I want you to note first of all, before we look at these three messages, that what John does is he presents us with the foundation of these messages. And what is the foundation of these messages? It is the everlasting gospel. Isn't that beautiful? Not just the gospel, but note if you will, it is the everlasting gospel. I, I like the very fact that that's exactly the phrase that John used, that, that it is the everlasting gospel. Why do you think that John labels the gospel as the everlasting gospel? Remember, he's trying to give them encouragement, right? That, that's what we understand. And all of the things that they are going to suffer that we read about in chapter 13, you know what? It's only going to be temporary. A lot of them are going to be put to death. They are. But you've got the everlasting gospel, which carries with it everlasting life. Does it not? You remember in John chapter 6 and verse 68 when many of the disciples went back and they stopped following Jesus and Jesus turned to the remaining twelve and said, will you also go away? You remember what Peter said? Lord, to whom shall we go? You've got the words of what? you got the words of eternal life. The Gospel, when we think of the Gospel, we understand it as good news. 
But it's the good news about Jesus Christ, is it not? And when you think about it, it's everlasting because the Gospel in saving man has always been a part of God's plan. It has. When you think about God's plan for saving man, that was not an accident. It wasn't a, a second-hand thought. But rather, when we go to the book of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, we learn that it was part of God's eternal plan. When you think about the church that you and I are a part of today, you think about salvation, you think about forgiveness of sins, all of the blessings that we get to enjoy in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that was part of God's plan from the very beginning of time. Even before He created this world in which we live, the everlasting Gospel, it, it was there. And note, if you will, it was to be preached to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The message of the Gospel was a message that was to simply go to everyone. Make sure it's who you were. Where you were on the social status. The Gospel was to go to you. Now, when I think about this message here, I can't help but think that what John is trying to get them to see is, is, is the way that Rome is going to be defeated is through what? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you think with me a moment. Rome is identified as a, as a very evil nation because of the choices that they are, they are making. And John is letting these people know that the destruction, the defeat of Rome, is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you tell me, in a world of wickedness, in a world that John would say lies in darkness, wickedness, sin, and you and I know that, just turn on the news, open up the computer, pick up the newspaper, we know that. Tell me, what is the defeat of wickedness? It's the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Interesting that when you think about that, and to the church at Rome, you remember what Paul would say in Romans 1 and verse 16? I'm not ashamed of the what? The gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's very interesting that the very thing that was going to defeat them, the Apostle Paul had written many years ago and told them that that is where salvation lies. And many of them did not obey it. But nevertheless, you've got this angel and the very foundation of the message is the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I need to understand that there's something or there's a thought, or there's an idea embedded within this word gospel. We think of the word gospel, we think of good news. And it is. It's good news to every individual who is obedient to the message. When I obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, I have salvation. I have eternal life. I have answered prayer, forgiveness of sins. I've got a hope that cannot be described in words. But what about those who choose not to obey the gospel? What about those who continually turn a deaf ear to the gospel? Go with me, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And there I want you to note beginning about with verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those that know not God. Now look at that next phrase. Don't miss it. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. The people of Rome are about to taste the wrath of God because of their continual rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ they are about to experience the judgment of God and so the gospel is good news to you and I who are willing to obey 
but it is sad news to those who refuse. Okay? So that's the foundation of these messages. All right, let's look at the first message or the message of this first angel. It's found in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give to Him and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. All right? So what is the message of this first angel? Number one, they are to fear God. Which is something that everyone should seek to do. The Bible teaches us in the book of Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole of man as some translations say. This is the all of man. This is His duty. Number one, they needed to fear God. But number two, look at what the message was. You give glory to Him. God is to be glorified in everything that we do in this life. Our responsibility is to seek to glorify Him. You think about Matthew 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? What is the very purpose of the good things that you and I do? So that people will glorify our Father which is in heaven. In everything that we do, we should live our lives with the utmost purpose of giving glory to God. And glory to God comes through the church, Ephesians 3 and verse 21. But not only should we fear God, and not only does He encourage them to give glory to God, but number three, He encourages them to worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Don't worship the individual who boasted of who He was. And boasted of what he did. But you worship of the individual who actually did those things. The very creator of this universe. And the one who continues to hold all things together. And that is God. Matthew chapter 10 and verse, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. You remember when Satan presented unto Jesus and said, All these things I'll give to you if you'll just fall down and worship me. You remember what Jesus said? You get away from me. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. God is the only being worthy of worship. And if these individuals were going to avoid the wrath of God, then they had to follow these three things. Because look at what it says. Why should they fear God? Why should they give Him glory? Why should they worship Him? Look smack dab in the middle. For the hour of His judgment it does not say it's coming. Do you see that? It's knocking at the door. God's had enough. And He is about to take care of Rome. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, what kind of a lesson or application can we learn from that today? We need to be individuals that we fear God. That we give God glory every day of our lives. That we live every day worshiping Him. Why? Because judgment is coming. There's going to come a day when judgment is going to be here. And every individual will stand before God. And they will answer for the lives that they have lived. And if we have not been those individuals that we lived our lives fearing God, referencing Him in everything, Individuals who we lived every day giving glory to God. And individuals that we lived every day worshiping Him and only Him. And it will not be a good judgment. So, that's where we're going to stop. Lord willing, uh, we will pick up next week in verse 8. And we will look at the message of the second angel. You have been a, a very great class. I, I appreciate your attention so very much. I, I want to continue to encourage you that even though I'm standing up here, this is for the folks at, uh, at home who are not able to be here uh, for recording purposes and they can be with us and feel a part of the worship. But I want to encourage you, don't be afraid to ask a question. I, I'm, I'm not in control of this class. Uh, I'm just simply trying to guide our man, mind in a good understanding. So I, I want to encourage you to ask questions. Those of you at home, if you've got a question, feel free to, to send it. Uh, I may not be able to answer it in, in this class, but 
Lord willing, Brother Lee will get me that question and then I will answer it later. But there's going to be a brief intermission and then uh, we're going to have uh, some announcements in our devotion. Good evening, everyone. It is good to have everyone here. We've got a, a pretty good crowd for a Wednesday night. We really need to work on inviting our, our neighbors and our friends that we know that aren't here, see if we can encourage them to be here. We're thankful for those that can join us on the live stream. Uh, we'll be thankful when you can be here with us in person as well. We do have several folks on our prayer list. We certainly want to remember them. We've got a couple of additions tonight. I'll also call to your memory the ones that we've been announcing, continue to remember Marva Johnson, Larry Jones, Patty Cowan, Joyce Wright, Marcia Jeffers, Nancy Mann, Nancy Nation, Jim and Mary Sue Williams, Rachel Reed, and Mackenzie Jones. And added to our prayer list tonight is uh, Jackson Lewis. Jackson is a co-worker of Chloe's and has been having trouble with seizures, so please keep Jackson Lewis in your prayers. Also, uh, Terrell has asked us to keep his sister Donna Bartlett and his niece Chrissy Bartlett in our prayers as well. So please remember all of these. Don't forget time changes. We're going to spring forward this weekend. So Saturday night before you go to bed, spring those clocks forward an hour. Uh, this coming Tuesday, uh, Bible class, 10 a.m. Be sure and keep that on your calendar. If you're able to be out at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, that would be great. Also, something else to put on your calendars. There's going to be a gospel meeting April 11th through the 14th in Cartersville. Dalton is going to be speaking there on the theme of giving a defense. So there will be more details on that in the bulletin. You can mark that on your calendar. If you're able to support that, we would encourage you to do that as well. Please be sure and check your uh, bulletins for more information and the bulletin boards in the back as well. A lot more information there. All the announcements I have at this time, at the appropriate time, Alex Holloway will lead us in a closing prayer, and now we'll turn the song service over to Jackson. Limitation song will be number 588. Song before the lesson will be number 335. First and last verses of 335. <clears throat> If the sky is above your grave,
Good evening. Back in time, about uh, October the 16th through the 31st, the year was 1938. N.B. Hardeman delivered 18 sermons at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. They are now referred to as the Hardeman Tabernacle Sermons. I wanted to very briefly highlight one of those sermons for you this evening. Brother Hardeman read two scriptures and then asked a very important question. Consider these scriptures. Here's the first. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female he created them. The next passage is Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. And Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for it is the righteousness of God, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that is written, the just shall live by faith. With those two passages in mind, here's the question. Is the gospel, as God gave it, adapted to man as God made him? Is it adapted to, is it suited to the man as God made him? So briefly first, let's consider the man as God made him. God made him with an intellect, the mind. The Bible calls it the heart, for with it, the Bible tells us man thinks. Man reasons. Man understands. And man believes. It's with the heart that these things are done. And there's passages that say those very things. And man calls that the intellect. Next, God made man with a will. We call that our will power. It is the power to act, the power to do. It's the power to choose. And you recall this, choose you this day whom you will serve. That has to do with the will of man. It's man's free moral agency as we call it. One's will to act, to do something in that regard. Third, man made, God made man with emotion. The ability to feel, to love, to experience sorrow, to experience joy. With these three attributes in mind, let's consider the gospel as God gave it. The gospel is based upon facts. What do we do with facts? What does man do with a fact? Facts are things that we think about, we give thought to. We reason with, we consider, we understand concerning them, and facts are to be believed. Those facts concerning the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, facts of the gospel are adapted to man's intellect, to his thinking. How is it applied to man's will? The gospel contains commands. Commands deal directly with man's intent, the intent of his heart, his purpose, the execution of those facts. Commands of the gospel require a choice to be made, choosing what we will do or what we won't do, whether to obey or whether not to obey. The commands of the gospel are, therefore, adapted to man's will. How are they applied to man's emotions? The gospel contains promises 
These promises are to be enjoyed. Promises of and the actual forgiveness of sin, which brings joy, which brings thanksgiving on our part to the Lord. The promise of Jesus Christ to never leave or forsake us brings us peace, peace to our souls. The promise of eternal life to be with our suffering Savior for all eternity brings joy to the heart. Thank God I look back and say, though my hands were stained in sin and my heart was blackened by it, there is a fountain free, filled with the blood that can cleanse me from every stain. We love Him because He first loved us. The gospel satisfies the emotional nature of the man. And there you have it. The man with intellect, with will, with emotion as God made him, and the gospel as God gave it applies and appeals to the intellect with facts, to the will, with commands, and to the emotion, through the promises and the love of our suffering Savior. Yes, the gospel, as God gave it, is adapted to, is suited to man as God made him. And in N.B. Hardeman's day, and much more so its prominence today, is the idea that it takes something outside of God's Word to convict and convert the man. There is no direct operation from heaven to convict and convert the man. There is no moving directly from heaven, no magical, no mystical, no supernatural illumination required. For the faith which was once delivered for all, delivered to the saints. We are to obey the gospel. We are to be subject to the gospel. Therefore, if someone is waiting for a direct operation from heaven, a supernatural experience of some sort to be convicted and converted, I am afraid you're going to be sadly disappointed. For it's from the heart that form of doctrine is to be obeyed. Obey the gospel as God gave it, as it applies to each and every one as God made him. Having heard the gospel, believing that gospel with the intellect that God gave, choosing to repent, using the will that God installed in all of us, and choosing to confess the sweet name of Jesus Christ, and choosing to be buried with Him in baptism, the act of our will, then we can experience the emotional joys of having done that very thing, to be in a right relationship with Almighty God. If there's anyone subject in any way to the gospel of Jesus Christ, won't you come, make your wishes known, as together we stand and sing.
Well, it's certainly been great to be out on this midweek Bible study. Appreciate Brother Ken for that outstanding devotion, Brother Jackson for leading us in songs, and everyone who took part in our Wednesday night Bible study. We appreciate you so, so very much. I want to remind you of Sunday morning Bible class at 10 a.m. I want to encourage you to come out and join us if you possibly can. Morning worship at 11 a.m. and then evening worship will be at 5 p.m. There are no other announcements. We are going to be dismissed in prayer at this time. Brother Alex is going to lead us in that prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you bless us with to come here and worship you. Hey, we'll take whatever we've learned today and use it in our everyday lives. Lord, we'll pray for those who are sick and those who cannot make it this time. Pray that if it be thy will, you'll help them to get better. Please be with us all as we depart today. Forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.